Even though he never technically won a WWE championship, Junkyard Dog was still a massive hit with wrestling fans back in the 70s and 80s. He created a kind of buzz that few performers even come close to. According to his official WWE bio, he was equipped with this unique combination of power, grace, and charisma that's rarely seen in the world of sports entertainment. Simply put, he had the stuff. His entrance theme music, that funky proto-rap classic Grab Them Cakes by Vicky Sue Robinson, combined with his menacing scowl, intensified by his collar and chain, struck fear into the hearts and minds of his enemies, and got his fans growling and barking like a pack of angry dogs. His fans were so devoted, one of them even jumped into the ring and threatened to shoot anyone who dare lay a hand on the junkyard dog. Long before he made a name for himself in the world of pro wrestling as Junkyard Dog, Sylvester Ritter played for his college football team. Eventually, he was drafted by the Green Bay Packers, but instead of pursuing an NFL career, he chose to chisel out a place for himself in the ring. Even though Vince McMahon never let him clinch a championship, Junkyard Dog did win the very first pay-per-view WWE event in 1985. Like so many of his peers, he struggled with substance abuse, problems that would eventually take a toll on his mind, body, and spirit towards the end of his career. Sadly, his life came to an end much sooner than expected and under extremely tragic circumstances. Stay with us to find out how he died and how his passing had an impact on the world of professional wrestling. And if you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to Facts First for more. The Junkyard Dog Died in a Car Accident even though he left the WWE in 1989, Junkyard Dog still had the desire to wrestle, so he jumped ship and joined the National Wrestling Alliance, where he had a rivalry with Ric Flair. After leaving the promotion in 95, he continued to wrestle in other circuits and took the time to train other wrestlers in his free time. That is, until his sudden car accident that took his life. Sylvester Ritter was pronounced dead June 1, 1998. He was 45 years old. The accident happened while he was driving home to Mississippi after visiting family in North Carolina. After losing control of his vehicle, it rolled three times before coming to a crashing halt. It's not known whether Ritter had drugs or alcohol in his system at the time of the accident, but it's likely he wasn't sober judging by his substance abuse history. A funeral was held in his memory in Russellville, North Carolina. Former Chicago Bull and NBA legend Michael Jordan counted Ritter as one of his dear friends and was said to have called his family to offer his heartfelt condolences. Ritter was officially inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2004. His buddy Ernie Lodd, who also happens to be a member of the Hall of Fame, inducted him into the Elite Club. Ritter's daughter LaToya accepted the award on behalf of her father. He's faced a lot of racism. Junkyard Dog is considered the first black wrestling superstar. Just like everything else, whenever someone is the first black anything, they often find themselves facing a lot of backlash, bigotry, and racism. One should note that racism actually ended up selling a lot of tickets back then. It wasn't uncommon for one wrestler to make racist comments towards him to rile up the crowd and fill the arena with spectators eager to see the racist wrestler get shut down in the ring. For example, when it came to Junkyard Dog's infamous feud with the fabulous Freebirds, racism was used extensively to add intensity to the narrative. Michael P.S. Hayes was under the impression black wrestlers didn't need to employ any specific gimmicks because, in his opinion, just being black was their gimmick. Hayes's blatantly prejudicial views didn't stop there either. He was known for freely throwing around the N-word and referring to Junkyard Dog as boy and various other slurs. Jesse Ventura was also well known for spewing hate speech around the ring. Sure, he was playing a bad guy, but it still doesn't give him a free pass to say the awful things he did on a regular basis. He had a crazed fan. Everyone knows pro wrestling has the tendency of embellishing the fact that a majority of fights are scripted and choreographed. A good wrestler can convince the audience that what they're seeing is the real deal. That means sometimes skilled wrestlers would find themselves in some pretty disturbing situations. It wasn't uncommon back in those days to hear about pros getting threatened, chased down, and attacked by fans who were caught up in the wrestling storylines. There was one time the fabulous Freebird sprayed Junkyard Dog in the eyes with hair cream. He claimed he would never be able to wrestle again, nor would he be able to see the face of his newborn daughter. It was a good show, but some people didn't understand it was just an act. Many fans responded to his situation as if he was actually injured. Quite a few viewers sent him money to help pay for his medical bills, while others decided to take a more direct approach. 
At one point during Junkyard Dog and the Fabulous Freebirds' feud, an irate fan jumped over a barricade and pointed a loaded gun at the Freebirds, demanding they leave Junkyard Dog alone. Fortunately, security was able to subdue the would-be assailant before he could fire. He was a hard drug user. A lot of wrestlers in the 80s were regular drug users. Junkyard Dog was no different, and his favorite substance was cocaine. According to Maxim Magazine, Junkyard Dog introduced the Iron Sheik to crack. His drug abuse was no secret. Not only did his fellow wrestlers know he had a drug problem, but so did promoter Bill Watts. But it didn't seem to matter as long as he kept selling out arenas like that. While the average fan didn't catch wind of Junkyard Dog's substance abuse problems until later, his drug use was well known among fans from New Orleans. It was a much smaller circle of wrestlers and fans, and everyone seemed to know about his frequent trips to the projects to meet up with drug dealers. One nasty side effect of his cocaine use was substantial weight gain. At one point, he was known for his impressive physique, but as the 80s raged on, he packed on the pounds. Commentators tried to explain it away, saying he was gaining weight because he was taking on bulkier opponents like the one-man gang, but that excuse only held water for so long. Wrestling magazines started referring to him as Junk Food Dog, and his weight gain likely contributed to his ousting from the WWF. Vince McMahon has always shown a preference for tall, chiseled, toned, and sculpted men over shorter or pudgier guys. He was washed up by 35. At 35, most wrestlers are in their prime. It's typically a chapter of their lives where they're at peak physical fitness, while retaining enough experience and respect that they could practically run the whole show if they wanted. That was not the case for Junkyard Dog. After he was cut from the WWF in 1988 to cut on costs, his time in the spotlight was essentially done. Not long after getting axed, he joined forces with the NWA, which later morphed into WCW, and he was given a main event run in 1990. This is when he was given his feud with Ric Flair. Not everyone was stoked about the rivalry, though. Wrestling Observer Newsletter called it the worst feud of the year. For the next few years, Junkyard Dog repeatedly signed with WCW, only to get cut shortly after rejoining. This was largely because of his conditioning and the fact that he wasn't able to draw in a crowd anymore. He had clearly lost his spark, but he wasn't ready to throw in the towel just yet. For the last few years of his life, he was pretty active in the indie circuit. Instead of enjoying what should have been the best years of his career, he was left doing gimmick matches with other washed-up wrestlers that found themselves in a similar position. Even so, he was still enjoying himself, all things considered. He never got tired of life in the ring. He loved crowds, whether they were big or small, it hardly made a difference. His only daughter also died young. On October 19, 2011, Latoya Ritter, Junkyard Dog's only daughter, was walking down the stairs at her private residence when she suddenly fell to her death. She was only 31. A few years later, Pro Wrestling Stories, a wrestling news blog, published a biographical retrospective article on Junkyard Dog, and they mentioned LaToya and how her cause of death was never officially revealed. A member of her family reached out to the site to clarify what happened. Apparently, she had a heart attack and was dead before she hit the ground. Now it's time to hear from you. Do you think Junkyard Dog would have been able to stage a comeback if he hadn't died so young, or do you think his career was essentially over at that point? Let us know what you think in the comments section below. And before you go, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to Facts First if you haven't already. Click the bell icon to stay updated on all our latest content.